Hey there, Agile musicians, and welcome to another episode of the Agile Bytes podcast, sponsored by Integrity Inspired Solutions, where we build software in an agile manner day in and day out. This podcast is about music. Cora, what's your favorite genre of music? 80s. Okay. False. Cora's actual favorite genre of music is orchestra music. And that's what our episode is about today, coincidentally. We're going to talk about drums and buffers and ropes and how we can use those to manage our work in progress. So as agile folks, if you've been in the game for very long, you know that limiting your work in progress is something that we all need to pay attention to, right? Having too much work in progress is the source of all kinds of team and delivery problems. It's probably the biggest contributor to the total delivery time of our items. And obviously when we have fewer things in flight, it's much easier to focus. It's easier to reason about these things. It's easier to make sure they get done in a timely manner. And honestly, it just helps us keep our sanity. If you think about your own personal productivity, if you have 10 things to focus on for the day versus one, it makes a big difference in how that day goes and what your productivity level is like. So I hope I don't need to sell you on the concept of limiting WIP, limiting your work in progress. If you want to know more about that, we do have episodes in the past where we've talked about that. But how do teams do that? I mean, it's, it's one thing to have the principle, right? Like limiting our work in progress to a manageable amount is a good thing. How do we go about that? And if you are using different established frameworks or strategies, then you've probably already seen ways to do this. Take Scrum, for example. Scrum limits WIP through the combination of the sprint goal and the length of the sprint. So you have a sprint goal. You are selecting the smallest amount of stories that you can select that will accomplish that sprint goal. And your modifier is how much time you have in the sprint to get these things accomplished. So the sprint goal limits your selection and the length of the sprint limits your selection. So you can't work on 20 features at once because you have a goal that trims down your number of features and you have a specific time box that limits the amount of things that you can actually get done. If you tend to skew more on the Kanban route, then the way they do whip limits a lot of times is by fiat. Teams will either explicitly limit the number of items that can be in a specific stage of the value stream. So you will often see those numbers above the columns on a Kanban board. Or some teams have kind of grown out of the column whip limits and are now doing more like system-wide whip limits. So instead of limiting the work of a particular column, we just might say, hey, this whole stream can really only reasonably have 12 items in it at once, and we want to keep that number at 12 for the most part, and off you go. But it limits whip basically by declaration, by, by fiat. Well, today I want to talk to you about another way that we can limit whip. This comes from the theory of constraints, Eli Goldratt, and the people who have really probably done the most to apply this to knowledge work would be the Tameflow folks, Steve Tendon in specific, and what we're doing is we're taking a concept from the theory of constraints and applying it to the flow of our knowledge work items. And it's called drum buffer rope scheduling. And I'm going to give you an introduction to that today. The basic idea of the drum buffer rope schedule is the constraint controls the pace of production. Or another way to say it might be the part of your process that is the, I'm going to say, is the slowest, everybody else needs to be moving at that same pace. Okay, So think about like if you've got a car and let's say all four tires kind of had their own rate of speed. Well, you would want all your tires ideally to be moving at the same speed, right? Even if any given tire could be moving faster than the others, you wouldn't want that. You would go around in circles if one or two of your tires were moving faster than the other tires, right? And so you would want everything in the system to be moving at that speed. Or imagine that you have a manufacturing plant and you have a series of machines that materials have to pass through. And some of these machines process more material than others. Well, you would want the whole line to be working at the same pace as the slowest machine. You wouldn't want every machine to be working at its maximum speed because if you did that, you would start to have materials pile up in front of one of the machines, right? Somewhere in the line, there's going to be a machine that can't process as fast as the other machines can. And you'll just start to have stuff pile up in front of that machine 
And the machines that are further down in the process are going to be starved for work because that's your constraint. And if you were to make any of the other machines faster, you're kind of wasting your time. And if you actually make one of the upstream machines faster, you're going to make the problem worse, right? That buildup is just going to get bigger and bigger. So the idea behind the drum buffer rope scheduling is we want to pace the entire system by the constraint. We want to pace the whole system by the part where things kind of take the longest, where the throughput is lowest. Now, I want you to know when I talk about that part of your stream where the throughput is lowest, that's not a judgmental kind of thing. Every system has a slowest part. Even if you have a highly efficient system, some part of it takes longer than others. Even if you were able to eliminate all the waste and inefficiency out of your system and you were you were the, you know, mid 90s Chicago Bulls of software development production. Some point in there is going to be the slowest point because work takes as long as it takes. You may have a difference in the amount of people who can do that job, and that may impact how fast things can move through that stage of development. Right. So every system is going to have this point. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to find that point. You need to identify the constraint. And we had a podcast episode a couple of weeks ago about that very thing. So go ahead and give that a listen if you want some tools and tips on how you might find your constraint. A kind of a back of the napkin way is just look at your whole flow and what portion of it has the highest flow time in general. That's probably going to be where your constraint is. Not 100% guaranteed, but probably that's that's where it's going to where where does work tend to pile up? You know, where what tends to be the slowest moving piece? But however you do it, you want to find your constraints. So that's that's the first thing you want to do. The second thing you want to do is you want to put a column in front of that constraint that's going to serve as kind of a mini backlog for that stage of the process. That is the buffer. So when we talk about the drum buffer rope, that's where the buffer comes from. We're going to put this column in front of the stage that is the constraint to hold work items. The reason that we do that is because whatever your constraint is, whatever the slowest point is in production, you never want them to run out of work. They are the point at which things move through the slowest. So you never want them to also be the cause of inefficiency of the system. You, you never want that constraint to be idle. You always want to have work for them. And so in order to do that, you create a little bit of a buffer in front of them, a little bit of a holding bin that's going to hold an extra work item or two extra work items or three extra work items. How many items should it be? I can't really tell you that. It depends on how fast things tend to flow through that state. So maybe the buffer just has one extra card in it, but it could be three, it could be five. It just kind of depends on how fast that area tends to burn through work. But what you want to do is have some cards racked up for them ready to go. As soon as they finish one card, they've got another one to pull right away. They're not waiting on anybody, right? They've got that little bit of a bin. Now, you don't want the buffer to get too big eh, because now we run into all the issues that come with work item aging, right? And so if you've got cards that are sitting in that bin for weeks and weeks, all the risks we talked about from work item aging come into play. And we did a podcast episode on that. Man, I just feel like I am calling back to podcast episode after podcast episode. That is just a testimony to the sheer amount of value that is coming out of this microphone. You guys should go through and just, you know what? Don't, don't even bother cherry picking. Just listen to them all. Just listen to all the previous episodes of this podcast and just imagine the value and context that you're going to bring to this topic once you've done that. What was I talking about? The buffer. So we want to make sure that we have the buffer full, but not too full because we don't want to trigger the dangers of work item aging. Okay, so we found our constraint and now we've got a column in front of it that holds a few work items ready for them to go, right? A, a little bit of inventory racked up. So now here's where the magic actually happens. Everyone else's signal to work comes from that constraint pulling a card out of the buffer. So if I'm upstream of the constraint, then it's my job to make sure that that buffer stays full. If I'm downstream of the constraint, then I start my work as soon as the constraint has work ready for me to go. So the constraint is setting the pace. If I'm upstream, I don't do any work until something falls out of that buffer. And then it's my job to put a new card in that buffer. 
If I'm downstream of the constraint, I'm not doing anything until the constraint has something for me to do. And then I jump in like a cheetah, right? Ready to go. I've, I've been waiting for that work and now I'm ready to process it so that nobody downstream is getting backlogged and nobody upstream is getting backlogged either. The whole focus is making sure the constraint has a buffer full of work ready to go and they provide the signal for everyone else to do something. Everyone is responding to the rate of speed of the constraint. And this is where the drum and the rope imagery comes into play. Because if you can imagine, my ancestors were Swedish Vikings and Vikings would have these long ships and people would sit in the long ships and they would row and you have to row together. And the way they kept time was somebody would beat a big drum in the front of the ship and you would hear the drum beat and you would row. You would hear the drum beat and you would row. You would hear the drum beat and you would row. Well, the constraint and specifically the depletion of the buffer is the drum. When a card moves out of that buffer, that drum beat sounds and everybody knows to row. The whole system springs back into action. An item was pulled from the buffer and now we need to fill the buffer back up. And that means people downstream have something that they need to process right away, something they need to work on right away. So the constraint is the drum and the rope is now pulling that work downstream, right? And so as soon as that thing moves out of the buffer, the people upstream, it pulls a work item onto their plate, right? And the people downstream, it pulls a work item onto their plate. So now we have ropes pulling the work towards the constraint or even away from the constraint, all triggered off of that buffer, all triggered off of a card leaving that buffer. So you've got the drum, which is the rate of speed of the constraint, the, or the rate at which cards leave the buffer, actually. You have the rope, which means when the drum goes off, we are pulling that work downstream. And you have the buffer, which is the literal buffer. So sorry, that image wasn't quite as cool as the drum and the rope, but you get the idea, right? That's the way the drum buffer rope scheduling works. And it limits whip without having to come up with any numbers or write any numbers above columns or anything like that, because you are only working as fast as the constraint. Now, some of you, perhaps who are in a management capacity, are hearing this and you are starting to sweat a little bit because you see right away, doesn't this mean that sometimes people are going to be idle? Yep. No, I'm sorry. That's pretty much the end of that story. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Is when you use drum buffer rope scheduling, that means that some parts of your system are not going to be working on cards at a given time because work is only triggered when what? When the constraint is ready for new work. That's what triggers everybody else to start work as well. And if the constraint is is busy working and the buffer's full, then the people upstream are not producing new cards for the constraint. And the people downstream are processing whatever item came out of the constraint. But once it's done, you know, they're just waiting for the new thing to come out. Now, this can be very unattractive to management. So let me try to soften the blow a little bit. First of all, I really need to challenge your assumptions that having everybody at 100% capacity is good. It's not. We, in fact, to keep up the callback thing, have a podcast episode on the dangers of having 100% utilization of your team and your system and your individuals. It's not good for everyone to be 100% utilized. Those of you who are fans of capacity planning, first of all, please be a fan of something else. But if you use capacity planning, this is one of the fallacies involved in capacity planning is if we have capacity, we should be using it. This is not true. There is really no reason for the parts of your production that are not the constraint to be producing more than the constraint can actually handle. In fact, you are making things much worse. You are making your delivery times worse. You are increasing quality risks and you are increasing the risk that the thing that you've been working on is no longer valuable. Those are all perils that happen when everyone is 100% utilized. And if you're interested in agility, you certainly can't be responsive to opportunities because you have no capacity to be responsive to opportunities. If opportunities come up, the quickest way you can respond to them is if you have available people, people who are waiting for work, then you can be instantly responsive to opportunities. If everyone is maxed out, you got to wait till someone isn't maxed out before you can respond to those opportunities. So there's just so many reasons why having full utilization is actually making you less productive and hurting your quality and hurting your agility. Again, I refer you back to the podcast episode if you want to learn more about that. 
But the other thing, if, if I haven't sold you on that yet, the other thing to consider is just because your people are not working on those work items, whether they're user stories or features or whatever your work items look like, that doesn't mean they're just sitting around, you know, playing games or fishing or whatever. They can still be doing other things. There are plenty of other things that software development teams can be doing that have value, right? They could be uh, upskilling, watching videos, learning new technologies. They could be doing spikes, proofs of concept. They could be coming up with innovative ideas about the project they're working on. They could be keeping documentation up to date. They could be increasing your test coverage. I have yet to run into the development team that doesn't have other things they could be doing, right? There, there's never the team that has all the test coverage they really want to have or, or has all the documentation they really want to have or has learned all the technologies that they really want to have or who has clarified all the requirements that need to be clarified. There's so many things that teams could be doing that are not production work that are still valuable. So when we talk about everybody being idle, we don't mean that they're just sitting around. Now, having said that, I don't know that it's a terrible option just to have them sitting around. You might find that in a competitive marketplace like we have now, especially where there's a lot of competition for people and talent, that having an offer like, hey, you only need to work when we have the capacity to process that work. Otherwise, you know, you can be watching videos or reading books or whatever. I mean, that's a powerful draw. You could probably get away even with not having compensation as high as certain other companies if you traded it off for quality of life benefits like that. And just be like, yeah, some of the time, you know, you, you could be watching funny cat videos on YouTube and we don't care as long as when the constraint sounds the drum, you're ready to go. And that's really what being quote unquote idle means with uh, drum buffer rope scheduling is it doesn't mean doing nothing. It can mean that. It just means that whatever they're doing, they can instantly stop it when the drum goes off. So you can be doing other kind of value added activities. It just can't be having more work in progress. It can't be starting new cards. It can't be getting something half baked. It has to be something that they can just turn away from and jump right back into directly software production, the user stories or the work items or whatever. So even though it might be unpalatable to think about having other people in the chain not, not working on cards, just keep that in mind. There are other value added activities they could be doing. It doesn't mean that they are just sitting around. And honestly, we all kind of need to get it into our heads that 100% utilization is actually hurting us. It really is. I am not kidding. So I hope this is a good introduction. You can always go on the internet and look up more details about drum buffer rope scheduling. If you want to see more specifics about how this could look on your Kanban boards or how it applies to software development in specific, again, I recommend books by Steve Tendon and, and his materials that will talk about drum buffer rope scheduling and knowledge work as well. Reach out to us. I'm happy to talk to you more about this stuff and what it could look like for your teams. But it's just a tool to have in your toolbox. If you've tried other ways of controlling work in progress and it just doesn't seem to be doing it, drum buffer rope is nice, it's organic, and it really is kind of one of the highest efficiency ways that you can have to control your work in progress. So, hey, I mean, give it a shot. What's the worst that could happen? You might find out that it's awesome. So go ahead and give it a try. Thanks everyone for listening to Agile Bytes. Agile does sometimes bite, but we don't think it always has to. If you enjoyed what you heard today, don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you happen to be using. And if you can, leave us a comment because we'd love to hear your feedback. What things would you like to hear about? What things did you hear that were valuable to you today? You can also head over to integrityinspired.com to sign up to our email list. But that's all for today, folks. We'll see you next time.